Welcome to the next episode of the Calgary Guide to Understanding Disease video series. Today we're talking about beta blockers, their mechanism of action and side effects. When talking about beta blockers, it's important to understand that we use two classes of beta blockers clinically. The first class are non-cardioselective. They bind beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. The second class is cardioselective beta blockers that bind largely to beta-1 receptors. Beta blockers bind to beta-1 and or beta-2 receptors of various tissues throughout the body, and they competitively inhibit the binding of sympathetic adrenergic molecules, such as catecholamines from the adrenal medulla, like epinephrine, to these receptors, thus reducing their normal adrenergic tone. Beta-2 receptor antagonism usually affects the lungs, the eyes, the central nervous system, and throughout other body tissue. Beta-1 receptor antagonism usually affects the heart and the kidneys. The effect of beta-1 or beta-2 receptor antagonism throughout all of these tissues in the body is reduced cyclic AMP production, cyclic AMP being an intracellular messenger, which in turn leads to complex tissue-specific intracellular mechanisms, which result in a variety of different effects in different tissues. Throughout the body, keep in mind that epinephrine normally indirectly increases the activity of the sodium-potassium pump on cell membranes, which moves three sodium ions out of cells per two potassium ions moved into the cells. So blocking epinephrine from binding the beta-2 receptor across the body tissues and producing cyclic AMP reduces the activity of the sodium-potassium pumps and reduces the amount of potassium ions moved into the cells. This increases the proportion of potassium that now resides in the extracellular fluid, which in turn is detectable in the serum even though the total body potassium remains the same. Increases in the serum level of potassium will of course cause hyperkalemia, which you can find dedicated Calgary Guide slides concerning this topic. In the lungs, blocking sympathetic hormones reduces the relaxation of smooth muscle circumferentially wrapped around the airways. This increases the resting airway muscle tone, which leads to bronchoconstriction and increased resistance to airflow, which in turn causes wheezing, dyspnea, and chest tightness, and may exacerbate underlying airway diseases such as asthma. In the eyes, beta-2 receptor antagonism reduces the ciliary epithelium's production of aqueous humor, the fluid that fills the anterior chamber of the eye, which reduces the intraocular pressure. In the central nervous system, beta-2 receptor antagonism blocks the adrenergic response mediated by epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is otherwise known as the fight-or-flight response to stress. This reduces tremors, irritability, and anxiety on the part of the patient. However, it also reduces the ability to produce adrenergic symptoms in response to hypoglycemia, which unfortunately can lead to hypoglycemia unawareness. Beta-1 receptor antagonism, on the other hand, mostly affects the heart and the kidneys. In the heart, beta-1 receptor antagonism reduces the chronotropy, the heart rate, and the conduction velocity of the heart. It also reduces the ionotropy, the contractility, of cardiac muscle. Both effects lead to a reduced demand for oxygen by the myocardial tissue. Reduced chronotropy leads to bradycardia or a reduced heart rate, which results in an inability to increase heart rate in response to stress such as shock or sepsis. Reduced ionotropy, reduced contractility, leads to reduced stroke volume, which reduces cardiac output. Reducing cardiac output has the consequence of decompensation of acute heart failure and dizziness and fatigue when the brain doesn't get enough blood. Reduced cardiac output also leads to hypotension because blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Beta-1 receptor antagonism reduces mostly diastolic blood pressure and thus may reduce coronary perfusion pressure. Note that coronary perfusion pressure is the result of diastolic blood pressure in the aorta subtracted by the left ventricles and diastolic pressure. So because of beta blockers' effect on reduced coronary perfusion pressure, before giving beta blockers, a clinician must ensure blood pressure isn't too low. Otherwise, giving the beta blocker may actually worsen acute myocardial ischemia because less blood is perfusing through the coronary arteries. In the kidneys, beta-1 receptor antagonism reduces the release of renin, which reduces the creation of angiotensin II and aldosterone. This in turn leads to the reduced absorption of sodium and water in the nephron, which results in an increased loss of sodium and water in the urine, which further reduces total blood volume, further reducing stroke volume, and reducing cardiac output, leading to the consequences of reduced cardiac output previously explained. And that's it for beta blockers, mechanism of action, and side effects. If you enjoyed this video or find this information useful, 
please like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks, and see you in the next episode of the Calgary Guide to Understanding Disease video series.